yes, you'd think that I would know how to speak into a microphone. After all of these years, my goodness. Well, good morning and welcome. Um, I wanted to say, um, it's nice to see people that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, and some other folks that I see from time to time. And uh, shall I call you Dr. Bodie? <laughs> but Bill, Bill, it's really good to see you. Uh, I spent some years uh, cleaning the church in Elyria, and I developed a, a friendship with a lot of folks from over there, and it's so nice to see Bill. And I met his wife for the first time today. Uh, welcome to Lakewood Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are pleased and happy to see you. We have a wonderful program today. We have some wonderful stuff downstairs in the kitchen that, uh, that I can't wait to for you guys to try, I made some rice and cranberries, and it's, a, it's, a, it's actually kind of a dessert. Um, but other people have brought some fantastic things. I certainly hope you enjoy your day today for today's work. But why are we here? To worship the Lord and, and to greet others that, that are interested. So on this particular day, at this time, in this year, where are we now? We are here. I think it's right where we need to be. And uh, so I'd like to... Um, get started with our next song, which, which is going to happen after uh, prayer. And Sylvester is there. I'd like to invite Sylvester up here for prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll have our song. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day that we could come and rest. Um, be with us as we worship, and be with those who are not here but are still worshiping with us in spirit. Uh, be with our pastor Quentin today as he gives us the message. May they be your words and not his words and help us to enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. In your name, amen. amen. This next song is Goodness of God. I'd like you to listen to it and worship in your hearts. Amen. It's running after, it's running after me. 
Alexandra, if you could come up here, she's going to uh, tell you about far more than I am able to even imagine. <laughs> but, but thank you, and uh, this should be very special. Thank you. Um, all right, so today we have a special farewell that we need to give our Nick. Um, so Nick, he came to our church, how many, how many months ago, or... We, February of this year. He came to February. Uh, we snatched him up, got him to play the bass, to get involved, and um, he is now moving on. And today his, is his last Sabbath here. So I want to ask you just a couple questions. I know we didn't end up doing a spotlight to actually get to know him before he leaves, but better late than never, right? <laughs> so first tell us, like, where are you from? What brought you to Cleveland um, and, and when? Um, answering the question where I'm from is a, a difficult question to answer. I've moved around a lot in my life. Uh, before I graduated high school, I had been to 13 or 14 different schools. Uh, I went to four different universities. Um, so I've lived all up and down the East Coast. I've lived in Texas for a bit, Hawaii for a bit. Um, so I'm, when people ask me where I'm from, I mainly just say the East Coast. That's, that's where I spend most of my time. Um, the majority of my life was spent in Florida. That's where I was directly right before I came here. Uh, what brought me here is I graduated college and I got a full-time job with an engineering company up here, Rockwell Automation. So I'm up here for a year for training and that training has come to an end. Um, and what brought me to Lakewood is I was Googling and you guys were one of the only churches that were open at that time. So that was nice. I didn't, after going to school online, I didn't want to do church online. Um, so this was one of the few ones that were open and one of the few ones that actually like acknowledged me as a person. It was a nice, warm, cozy environment here. So that's why I stayed. That, that's so nice. <laughs> um, okay, so just a couple questions also about, a little bit more about you. So what is one thing, I know we don't know a lot about you, but what is one thing that most people don't know about you? So having spent 15 of, 15 of my years in Florida, um, not a lot of people know that I, I really love the cold because um, a, a lot of people don't move to South Florida for the cold weather. Um, my house is set at 63 degrees. It's very nice for me, and I just go around in shorts and a shirt, and I'm very happy. Um, and also, after living about half of my life in Florida, I don't really like the beach. So if you like heat and you like the beach, you go to Florida, and since I like the cold and I don't really particularly like the beach, I like fresh water more, I figured I might as well spend half my life right next to it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so interesting. Okay, so um, next question. What are you most proud of accomplishing in life? Uh, as of now, my most proud accomplishment is finally finishing college. Uh, growing up, I 
people could not keep me in school. I would, I would leave school as early as I could. I would skip school if I could. Um, but luckily, I got that out of my system while I was young. And then when I went to college, I was still kind of against it, but I finally found my niche, got there, graduated, and I was, I was most proud of graduating and making uh, an impact on my, on my classmates who didn't see school the way I did, and I got to get to that point a lot earlier than, it, than I did, so I was ha happy about that. We're really going to miss you. <laughs> and by the way, um, Nick's mom is visiting us today from Delaware, so she's sitting there and, and tearing up. Yes, you have a good son. <laughs> Um, okay, so tell us um, what did, well, I guess you told us a little bit about the church, but what did, what did you like the most about Lakewood Church? Um, what I liked about Lakewood Church was the same thing I like about, you know, smaller companies. You can get in there and make a difference quicker, or at least get to know the lay of the land quicker. I came from a, a bigger church in South Florida where I knew about 50% of the people that went there, and here it's about the same, but I went there for 10 years, I went here for almost one. So it was nice to get to meet so many people so quickly and it was nice to get in and part of the system. That's, that's wonderful and that's all due to you guys too, you know, so, so props to you guys. And finally, tell us about where you're going and um, what does the next journey in your life entail? So I will be moving to Chattanooga, Tennessee in about seven days. Um, so one of the meccas of Seventh-day Adventism. And it'll be nice to be around more Seventh-day Adventists, get to meet more people. Um, I'll be finishing, since I'm done my training, I'll be starting my full-time job there of doing what I got to do and personally get to reaffirm my faith around so many Seventh-day Adventists, see what walks of life they come from and just be sure that I'm, I'm rooted in my faith. Well, make sure you guys keep him in your prayers as he moves on, and we definitely want you to visit us whenever you do make it up to the cold, okay? <laughs> and um, Dolly, he, he has a couple words he wanted to share because you've been such a nice part of our worship team. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> uh, you know, it's really hard for me now to say anything because, uh, you know, one year ago when I first time met with Nick, it was like, ah, oh, guy from Florida, oh, okay, let's, let's talk, let's, let's do something. And when I, when I uh, got this information, he played the instruments, you know me, you guys know me. <laughs> I, I already started talking with him and when I, uh, I, I got this information, he played bass, he played guitar, little bit piano. I was just, oh my gosh, okay. But honestly and seriously, Nick, you are an amazing person. When I start talking with you, it was everything like, like, like oh, okay, it's like, uh, you know, major flat you know, in music, you know, you're just switching something. But when we start talking more and more and talk deeply about the God, about the worship team about the stuff what everything making our life together in a church in a worship team in everywhere you became in my heart and in my eyes just amazing person who has the personality who has everything what has to have young man who want to make something very good in his life and I think Everybody in our church, especially me, we will really, really miss you. And I already miss you. <laughs> and believe me, friendship and brotherhood <laughs> in, in, a, in a church under the God, it's something what makes us like uh, soulmates. You know, when you feel this connection, this chemistry between us. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Nick. And I, I wish you really, really huge successful and uh, lots of blessing in your heart, in your life. 
and we will, we will you really, really miss. Can we, we wanted to ask the pastor if he can come up and do a special prayer blessing for you. So, Before I have that prayer blessing, I just had one quick question. Liking 64 degrees in Florida, did your air conditioner ever have a break? Um, so, so my air conditioner uh, was my air conditioner because we had central AC for the house, but I also had a supplemental AC in my room <laughs> so I could survive. We're going to pray for you. <laughs> Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the time that we've had with Nick here at the Lakewood Seventh-day Adventist Church. Lord, we rejoice in how he's been able to worship with us, but yet also be a part of the worship, to be able to express his love for Jesus through what he does and what he has done. And so now, Lord, he's moving on where he's going to be going to the beautiful state of Tennessee, uh, Lord, there you have a mission for him. There you also have a ministry for him. It's more than just a job, but Lord, it's who he is. And Father, I just pray that those who come in contact with Nick will see Jesus in his eyes, in his life. And Father, we want to ask a prayer of blessing to be upon him at this moment. In Jesus' name, and the people said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Nick also cooks and bakes. So there you go. So prepare your hearts and your minds for our next song. Go tell it on the mountain. Um, if I may, Nick, where, wherever, there you are. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to meet you. To know about you even more is outstanding. I've been to Chattanooga. And uh, go to Lookout Mountain, Ruby Falls. Ruby Falls, 1,000 feet inside the mountain is a waterfall, and it's, it's a fantastic journey. So, uh, and, and we wish you the best on your journey, sir. Thank you. Go tell it on the mountain.
giving time, it is offerings and tithes. And um, Bill, <laughs> uh, I'm going to help you in, in a second, but I'd like to ask Alexandra to come down, and she has a special information about community uh, Adventist services, and please do that, and I can help Bill with uh, what he needs to do. All right, so today is uh, worship, our giving today that we will be doing. The loose offering is going towards Adventist community services. And I don't know if anyone knows um, much about this organization. You might, right? Um, one thing is actually Lakewood Church. We are part of Adventist community services because we have our own community center here at church. And um, I just went uh, this week, I went on the website to see if there are any others in the area. We're actually the only Adventist community service center in Cleveland. And then the next closest one is in Medina, I believe. Are they st do they still have it operating? Or it will be opening again. That's right. So today's loose offering is about that. So the deacons can go around collect. Um, this all, all this offering goes to the North American division and it gets distributed amongst. Um, there's over 1,300 Adventist community services in the um, North American division. That includes U.S., Canada, Guam, Micronesia, and Bermuda. And um, a, a, something I found very interesting, too, well, first, their mission is to serve the whole person. So it is taking holistic ministry and that approach. So it's providing for people's physical, mental, social, and spiritual needs. And um, they, they incorporate and they, um, they lead out this mission in many different ways. Um, whether it is educating leaders, um, giving everything from refrigerators to computers to wheelchair ramps and storage sheds, um, having a disaster relief response. Um, every, every center is a little different about what they provide. Uh, we have a community center where we pro provide food and clothing to those in need. Um, and some others have more volunteers where they go build things in the community or do disaster response. Um, and one interesting thing was Adventist Community Services was actually started in the 1800s under another name. Um, and then eventually it ended up becoming Adventist Community Services. And in 1983, it was recognized that there needs to be this little bit more organized agency for international aid. So ADRA was, was created in 1983 to provide humanitarian aid outside of North America where it all started. Um, so it's, it was very nice connection for me to see that. Um, so that is, so it's an important uh, offering for today uh, for our Adventist Community Services, and we hope you will give. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for um, opening our, our hearts and for all the blessings that you've given us. Help us to give back to others that may not have um, as much as we do. Um, help bless the, the gifts and the offerings that we've given now to go to the right places um, here and help us to remember those outside of um, the country as well. And uh, we thank you so much. Help us to remember the, to give our time, to give our talents, and to give our uh, blessings away to others. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading today is, will be brought to you by Mandor. And um, it is Luke 1, 38. And there it is. And come on up here, if you would, please. And thank you for doing that. Um, it was sort of a Johnny on the spot kind of, hey, would you like to do this? And my goodness, you're tall. <laughs> but outstanding, a very, very handsome young man. Thank you very much for, for doing this. All right. So today's scripture reading is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. 
The next song is a familiar one. And um, let's see. Are we supposed to stand on this one? Yeah, let's stand up for this one because uh, are we all faithful? Sometimes not, but because he's faithful, we can be faithful. And I really, this is a beautiful Christmas song. So everybody continue and let us begin. Thank you very much. Wow. That'll get the blood going. Children's Church begins now in the, uh, the room across in the school down in the basement there. And all these little guys like this are going to gather together and have a great time. I believe Andrea is our teacher and probably could use a hand or two. So if, if you have a minute to, to help out, that would be nice. And then we... Uh, have the children there and our pastor here worship God through his message Mary's frame of mind our pastor today is Pastor Quentin Purvis and of which I'm very proud and uh, um, oh I, I guess it's just it's, a, it's, it's nice to introduce you it's nice to have you as a pastor and uh, we've had previous pastors we have pastors now and I love every one of them I especially Kind of, kind of like you very, very much, sir. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but that being said, please welcome Pastor Quentin Purvis. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I like you too, Wesley. It's so good to be here in the house of the Lord. Can you say amen? I have been thinking about this message all week. I have entitled it, Mary's Frame of Mind. 
Matter of fact, have you have ever been in a bad frame of mind? Have you ever told somebody, I'm not in the frame of mind to deal with you today? Amen? We've all been there, and we all understand that. But do you understand what the word frame of mind means? Here's the definition. The definition is a frame of mind, an individual, individual's cognitive state, attitude, and emotions at a certain point in time. That means that when you are inconvenienced, when you are disappointed, when you are confused, that's when you can say what state of mind you are in. And today we want to take a look at the Christmas story. Don't you love this time of year? It's the time of year that we get to focus on Jesus. It's the time of year that we get to open up and experience the greatest gift ever, but before we move forward, I invite you just to bow your heads for a moment as we pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, this is your word. These are your words. And Lord, I pray that the people don't hear the messenger, but they hear who the messenger is about, and that's you, Jesus. Lord, may you be the greatest gift that we've experienced today and will ever experience in the future. In Jesus' name. And the people said, if you have your Bibles, this will not be on the screen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to go to the book of Luke. And I want to start in Luke verse one, or chapter 1, verse 26. This is our Christmas story. Now, as I'm reading this story, I want you to think about something. I want you to ask yourself the question, what is Mary's state of mind. That's what the message is about. So let's read the story together. Are you there? If you're there, say amen. Now, in the sixth month, an angel, Gabriel, was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was who? Mary. Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled. And his saying, at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in, in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said, to the angel, how can this be since I don't know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the what? The Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, our scripture reading, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Wow! Can you imagine, were you trying to track her frame of mind? As we were reading the scripture together, can you realize that the inconvenience that she is about ready to face? She's 16 years old. And now she's pregnant. 
want to talk about being inconvenienced, wait a minute here. But how? And not only is she inconvenienced, think about this, how many of you wives would go horseback riding with your husbands when you're just about ready to give a baby? She had to sit on a donkey. Not only did she have to endure the donkey, but she had to pay the taxes when she got there. You want to talk about being inconvenienced. And Mary is able to say, Behold your maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Wow. What about disappointments? Did she experience disappointments? When she arrives in her hometown, all the Hampton Inns are closed up. Even the Red Roof Inns are all done. She has to settle and pay for a barn. You want to talk about bed bugs? I'm sure that they had bed bugs. I remember one time when my wife and I were doing a mission trip. I, I've, I've driven bus since 1992, and uh, I had my CDL, and I would drive from Michigan, a bus, all the way down into Mexico. Now, the guy who is, the man who is um, operating this, he's been doing it ever since. I've gone and held a series of meetings with him. Uh, the last place was in a village out of Cancun. But I want to tell you, he always picked a very $25 a night place when we got into Houston, Texas. My wife and I went into our room. She would not even take off her shoes. We were afraid to pull back the sheets. So guess what we did? We slept on top of the bed. But Mary is inconvenienced by all of this. And she's still saying, I am your maidservant? Wait a minute, what about years later when she has to see the son that she raised, the son who was told to her to be the son of God, dying on Calvary's cross? Can you imagine the confusion that she had to endure? But, but, but. There's no doubt that Mary's frame of mind was challenged. Now, the purpose of my message is going to be here on the screen. Like Mary, you can choose your frame of mind. And I'd like to even change it. I, I know that I just came to my mind as I walked up here. Instead of like Mary, you can choose your frame of mind. Like Mary, you can build your frame of mind. But how do we do that? There's actually five points to the building of the frame that I'd like for you to look at today. These five points can change your life as you begin putting yourself into the frame of mind of heaven. We don't want to be in the frame of mind of this earth, but we want to be in the frame of mind of God's kingdom. And that very first one is faith. Can you say that? Faith. And faith is understanding what's going on. Faith is knowledge. And God gives us knowledge to endure what we're about ready to go through so that we can all have the frame of mind of Mary. Are you ready for this? Let's go to the very beginning. Let's go to the Garden of Eden. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Adam and Eve have just allowed the enemy to overtake them. They chose autonomy instead of what God says. Mary looked at what the devil says, and the Bible is very clear that she accepted what she thought over what God said. 
That was the beginning of the troubles and sorrows that you and I experience today. That's what puts us in what I would say a bad frame of mind. But I want you to notice, because when Adam and Eve sinned, God had a plan. And God looked down upon Adam, and Jesus walked in the garden in the cool of the day, found them hiding behind the tree of good and evil. The Bible does say trees, but the Hebrew says tree. They were hiding behind their own lie. But we do the same today. They were hiding, and God goes looking for them. But when God goes looking for them, he doesn't go looking for them with a pointed finger, what have you done? God says, I got a plan to save you. It's going to cost me my life. But I'm going to save you. I'm going to put you in a better frame of mind. Matter of fact, before you leave this garden, I can give you a frame of mind that will be with you forever. No matter what happens. And notice what it says here in Genesis chapter 3. This is key. Are you ready for this? Verse 15. Genesis 3, verse 15. Now, I want you to know who's there at this tree. You have God, Jesus. He's at this tree. You have Adam, you have Eve, they're at this tree. You have the devil and the serpent or the dragon, he's at the tree. Are you with me so far? And so what happens is that God makes it very clear, I will put enmity between you and the who. You're not going to like the woman. Why? Because what comes through the woman is going to destroy you, Lucifer. Because I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Christmas child. That's the baby going to be born in Bethlehem. We are going to experience salvation through the seed of God. We're going to have a new life through Jesus Christ. And he shall bruise your head. But you're only going to be able to strike at his heel. Lucifer, your days are numbered. Sin will be finally destroyed. Because through the woman, I'm going to bring salvation to humanity. I want you to note that Lucifer's watching. And he looks at the woman. Have you ever seen this before? When you've made somebody upset, they look at you and they go, That's what Lucifer does to Eve. And from that moment on, women have to suffer incredible abuse. It's here. By the way, it's in prophecy. Look at Revelation chapter 13. Here it is again. You see John on the island of Patmos. He saw this. He saw all of this. Look what he says. Genesis chapter 12, verse 13. Revelation, thank you. Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. Here it is. Remember the tree, an imagery back to the garden. Are you ready for this? Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he made friends with the woman. Did I say that right? Did he make friends with the woman? He what the woman? He persecuted the woman. Why? Who gave birth to the male child. That's Jesus. We liken in Revelation the woman to a church. 
Why do we liken the woman to a church? Because Jesus is the foundation of our church. And yet God said in the garden that through the woman is coming the Savior of the world. And so when that devil looked at all those women, he says, I've got to take, make sure that they are, don't have the right frame of mind so that they won't accept Jesus into their life, into their body. And the devil comes after them. Oh, it, it's worse. Look at this. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was happy with the woman. Correct me, what does it say? The was enraged with the woman and went to make what? Went to make war. Do you realize that in the garden, the devil looked at the woman and says, I'm going to make your life miserable. From the very beginning, he made war on the woman. And that's why I believe that God has a special place in his heart for the women of the Bible. Do you realize that the Bible reveals how the women have been mistreated, but it never condones it? I had a lady in my other church say, why is it that the women get bad raps in the Bible? They're mistreated, they're abused, they're second-class citizens. Why is that? And I said, it's because the devil doesn't like you. The devil has gone out to make war with you. Oh, but that doesn't mean that you're second-class. It doesn't mean that you are disgraced. It means that you have something special about you. Isn't it interesting? Manny, listen to this. The Lord God sends Joseph a dream, but he appears in bodily form through Gabriel to, his, to Mary. Did you catch that? Did you also notice that this is not the only place? Look at Hagar. Let's go over here real quick to Genesis chapter 16. Take a look at this. Hagar is Sarah's maidservant. And the Bible actually says that Sarah became and started despising her maidservant, Hagar. Now, I understand that Abraham did the wrong thing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And we're going to come to Hannah because she was done wrong too. But Abraham found somebody else because she was barren. Now that does not make a happy home. Do you hear what I'm saying? When you bring another man and women, you bring another man or a man, you bring another woman, it does not help your relationships at all. So she's despised, she runs away, and look at verse, or Genesis 16. God appears to her in chapter 7, or in verse 7, 16, 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of the water. Did you see that the angel comes in bodily appearance to Hagar? It's the first time that we see in the Bible that an angel appears. Now, I'm sure that the glory was covered. I'm sure of that. But he appears to God, appears to a woman, and gives Hagar the same promise. Your seed, Ishmael, is going to be a mighty king upon the earth, and I'm going to make his descendants like the sand of the sea. Have you heard that one before? And here's what I want you to see. 16, verse 13. You got to see this. Look at this. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Wow. Wow. 
Do you see, here's where the faith comes into play as we build our frame of mind. By knowledge, we know that the devil is going to attack the women. We also know that the devil is going to attack humanity, amen? But it's through the woman that the Messiah is to come. I'll tell you what, men, you're not off the hook. The devil's got a plan for your destruction too. And he's going to dig deep into your past and find those little cultivated tendencies that you fall into and he's going to try to expose those so that you will trip up today. Oh, he's, he's got your number. But by faith, we understand that. You see, by faith, we realize that God comes through this earth, through the woman, and the devil tried to make sure that no woman would receive God's son. But aren't we so glad that he did? So that's our first one is faith. Our second one is risk. Take a look at the risk that God has. He's calling a 16-year-old to be mother of his son. Now, is that a risk? She's never been a mother before. She's never had the experience. She's young. How is she going to be the mother of the Son of God? Isn't that a risk? But have you noticed it's very interesting Maybe it's riskier to choose an adult for this job. Maybe it's risk, there, maybe that's the risk because you know what needs to be done. These people don't know what needs to be done. And that's when God says, guess what? Now I can use you. Amen? You see, God doesn't call the qualified. He, what's the rest of it? qualifies them. I tell you, sometimes people who have education, and I believe in education, don't get me wrong, pastor, is not downing education, amen? If you want your doctors, go for your doctors. Go for it. But what I'm saying is that even the Seventh-day Adventist church was founded in the 1800 by teenagers. By teenagers. I remember when my, I, I was at Southern College. Where, where are you at? There he is over here. I was at Southern College. I was graduating. My wife and I were just married, and, and we were going to wait at least five years before our first born, but guess what? Science failed. I was just graduating and being, I just got a call to the Michigan, you know, for, to be a pastor there where I was going to be for the next 18 years. But I remember my wife saying this. Now, my wife is extremely intelligent. She was who's who in American colleges. She was on the dean's list. While she was who's who in American colleges, I was who's he. <laughs> I was on the other side of the spectrum. But my wife said this, Quentin, I've never been a mother. What do I do? And I said, well, I've never been a father. What do I do? And both of us came from very dysfunctional homes. We didn't have the example of what a good mother or good father was. But when you raise your child in Jesus and have God in your home, then he begins working miracles in your life. Amen? And so that is the risk. Matter of fact, the less we have sometimes can be better. And I love what Master Sergeant Roy Benavides says, a, um, a recipient of the Medal of Honor. It's in this slide right here. It's coming. Here it is. Here it is, I love this. A positive attitude carries you further than what? 
That's true. A positive, that's what they train, train the Navy SEALs. When you realize that your body can't do it, here's what they say, it's usually your mind that destroys you. Because true seals reach deep down inside when they have no more power, no more strength, and then they come up with that strength. So I'm going to make it is better than to say I can't. Because then you defeat yourself already. But a positive attitude carries you further than your abilities. So that is our second frame. Our second point of this illustration. We looked at faith. That is the risk. We don't know what we're doing. All right, but God knows what he's doing. But let's take a look at the third Let's take a look at the next one. I call it the awe moment. And this is going to be Hannah. I know that, you're, I know that our head elder, Manny, he preached a powerful sermon last week. Can you say amen to that? I know that he does. I, I tell you what, I love listening to him. He's got such passion. And he was preaching on Samuel. And I said, well, I'm going to preach on Samuel's mother. Because remember, the dragon, the devil, is trying to attack the woman because it's through the woman that the Messiah is going to come. And, and you know, her husband, Hannah's husband, does not... I'll just be right up front. Her husband seems very arrogant in the story. Why do I say that? Because Hannah was barren. Couldn't have any children. So he finds another woman. And they live in the same house. Do you see a problem? <laughs> but that's culture. No, I, I, you know what? That's not culture. That's insanity. Yeah. And here is the arrogant part of it. It's found in verse 8. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah... Why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Here it is. And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better than to you than ten sons? Ooh, where were the lawyers at that time? But that's not it. Her grief, her state of mind, remember her frame of mind was not good. Her frame of mind, where she, in verse 13, it says, now, now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. Here's the point. People didn't pray silently in the Old Testament. I learned that when I was at Southern College, people don't, didn't know how to pray silently. When they prayed or they talked or they read can you imagine everybody reading the scriptures at the same time in church? That's why they only had one person read. Because they couldn't read silently. And then, when God answers her prayer, verse 18, and she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went away, ate, and her face was no longer sad. Did you see the change of mind? Because God came into her life. God took possessions. And here is the awe moment. It's Hannah's song, chapter 2. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Ah, oh, That's an awe moment. It's called humility. Matter of fact, the whole song that Hannah writes has a theme most scholars will say. It's where God humbles or exalts the humble, but humbles the exalted. That's what the whole song is about. Mary humbles herself and she's exalted. 
Saul exalts himself and he will be humble. But notice, I love what C.S. Lewis says on this. True humility is evident when a man designs the most beautiful cathedral in the world, and he knows it's the most beautiful cathedral in the world, but he would be just as pleased if someone else had designed it. Ah, oh, isn't that powerful? That's the risk or the awe moment, the awe factor. I want us to take a look at the memories. Let's take a look at the next point. We looked at faith. We looked at risk. That was the awe. Now we're looking at the memories. Do you notice how the frame is starting to go around the picture? Do you notice the acronym? You'll never forget this frame after that. The acronym F. R-A-M, not Fram, I'll get to the E. Don't worry, I'll get to that E there. But here is the memories. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 19. Luke chapter 2, verse 19. Shepherds come running in from the field because the angels of heaven could not remain silent. And that's the beauty of it. When Jesus comes into your life, you can't be silent. You cannot be silent. But Mary, here it says in verse 19, are you there? But Mary kept all these things and pondered them where? In her heart. In the times of discouragement, she will remember what the shepherd said on the plains of Bethlehem. In the challenging times when she sees Jesus upon the cross, she will remember what the voice of the angel, she will remember the voice of the shepherd, she will remember the voice of Anna, she will re remember the voice of Simeon, she will remember these things, and even though they crucify him on the cross, she will believe that he's still the Son of God. That changes your frame of mind. No matter what the world throws at you, and it doesn't want to throw roses at you. Matter of fact, it wants to throw things that you find in the barn. But that's what the world wants. The world wants you to stink. But God wants you to be fragrant. Amen? Amen? You see, I love what Ellen White says. This is beautiful. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led how? Has led us in the past. You know, there's been some times, I've been in the ministry for 30 years. Dude, that's a long time. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But there have been some challenges in my ministry where I have felt, am I really done? Should I move on? Lord, it just seems like everything's falling apart. But then I go back in my mind, and I remember how he's called me. Amen. And I remember the evidence that he gave to make sure that I stay true in the ministry. You know what the biggest one was? Here it is. I remember Derek Morris. You ever heard of Dr. Derek Morris? Hope TV president. You know, he was my mentor in college. And he looked at me, he says, Quentin, he had that English accent, Quentin. He goes, I feel impressed to tell you something. You have your hands to the plow. You can't turn back now. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that is in the Bible? He who puts his hands to the plow and turns back is what? It's not worthy for the kingdom of heaven. I want to be worthy. I want to be worthy. So you know what? I have not looked back since. But here you have the memories. And so let's take a look at our frame once again. We have our, we have our four areas, our four sides. We have our faith. We have our risk, 
we have our awe, and we have our memories. Notice all of these are at times, special times, when we are inconvenienced, when we are disappointed, when we are confused, and when, what's the last one I put up there? I'd like for you to go to our last verse here found in Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, I call it Jesus' Hall of Fame. It's the begats, it's, the beat, it's those who are in the lineage of Jesus. Then the book, verse 1, here it is, in the book of genealogies of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brother, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Abinadab, and Abinadab begot Nashan, and Nashan begot Salmon. Anybody want to do the scripture reading from here on out? <laughs> David, oh, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Salmon by her wife who had been the wife of Uriah, I find it fascinating that these four women are found in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Because they are what we have. We can look at their life and have our frame of mind changed. Let's take a look at the first one. Let's take a look at um, the next slide. Ah, Tamar, the Canaanite. Tamar was Judah's son's wife. And I do mean sons, because the first son refused to have a child through Tamar. And he was put to sleep. The second son refused to have a wife through Tamar. And yet Tamar knew that Judah, the lineage that through Judah that the Messiah would come. So she had a knowledge, remember the faith? She had a knowledge that the Messiah was to come through her. That's quite a responsibility. And now Judah wants nothing to do with her, puts her on ice, tells her to go stay at home with her mom, will not even recognize her. And so she does something unconventional. She dresses up like a prostitute, meets Judah along the way. Now you have to ask yourself, who's, who's, who's unconventional here? She becomes pregnant through Judah. Judah sees a way out, now I can destroy her. I mean, there's a real follower of God right there, you know. Let me see if I can destroy her now, clear my conscience of that. And what does she do? Here's the father's stuff, the ring and signet. And I want you to take note what Judah says. You are more righteous than me. And she becomes the grandmother of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Look at the abuse. Look at how she was inconvenienced, the disappointment, the confused. Even Judah tried to shame her, and she rose above and became Jesus' grandmother. Let's take a look at the next one. Rahab, the prostitute. She lived in a land that was to be destroyed. Israel was to come into Jericho, clean house. Not one person was to survive that encampment. But deep inside of all that corruption was one soul appealing to God, of, the God of heaven. Because she saw that God's people were right. They had been worshiping Baal. 
They have been worshiping these false gods. They have been doing it right. And matter of fact, here's the beauty of the story. God sends his chosen people to her house. Maybe it's angels that need to come to your house. Maybe. But he sends angels, God's people, and her frame of mind changes because even though she's going to be destroyed, she puts up a scarlet banner. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Shouldn't we put up the scarlet banner of Jesus? She puts up the scarlet banner of Jesus, and guess what? She becomes the grandmother of Jesus. You see these examples? Oh, I'm not done. Let's take a look at Ruth. Now, Ruth intrigues me. I truly believe that Ruth is the Martin Luther King of her day. God's people didn't like her because who she was. Matter of fact, Naomi he says, you know what? I don't even want you to come home with me. Go home to your parents. They're not going to treat you right. They're, they're, they're not going to help you. Matter of fact, you're not going to get a decent job. You're going to have to work in the pits. You're going to have to work on the sidelines. And here's the beauty of it. Are you ready for this? What does she say? Oh. Here it is. Your God will be my God. And whether they despise me or not, your people are going to be my people. Amen? Oh, that's Moab. She was a Moabite. Though she was despised because of her race, she does not let that affect her frame of mind. And she becomes a grandmother of Jesus. Now the next one I have a lot of thought for. Her name is Bathsheba. Did you notice that her name is not even mentioned in the book of Matthew? And I really want to focus upon that last one called shame. Because even today, people blame her. They blame her for being in the wrong place at the right time. And I've heard, people, I've heard pastors preach this. I'm scratching my head. Wait a minute. He's the king. She, he summons her to his place. That's called power rape. Are you with me? Not only is she called to his place... But look at the inconvenience. She becomes pregnant. And her husband, who is faithful to David, is killed by David. What is her frame of mind like? What is her frame of mind? But here's the justice. Are you ready for God's justice here? Because was she done wrong? Yeah, she was. But she will not be known ever as the husband of David. Uriah's name will go throughout eternity. She will be known as the wife of Uriah. That's justice. And her frame of mind helps her to become the grandmother of Jesus. I don't know about you, but you see, like Mary, you and I can choose our frame of mind. And as we take a look at this Christmas season and we see everything that's going wrong in our nation, it's going wrong. You see all the injustice? Look at the examples of those who went through worse. But they're still in the lineage of Jesus. 
And I truly believe with all my heart that everyone sitting here today, somebody has done them wrong. Can you say, I, you don't have to say amen. You've been mistreated somehow. But the foundation of our faith is found in the rock of Jesus. And this, we are now closing this message up right now. And praise team is going to be coming up here in just seconds. But my question is, where is your frame of mind? What is your frame of mind? You may not become, ladies, the grandmother of Jesus. Men, you may not be the grandfathers of Jesus. And we know that that's not true, going to ever happen. But we will become the sons and daughters of Jesus. We will become the sons and daughters of God. We will become the sons and daughters of the Spirit. We will become in the lineage of Christ because he will look down through ages and the blood that was poured out was prophesied in the Garden of Eden. So may this Christmas season be all about Jesus. And may you begin building your frame of mind based on Jesus. Let us pray, Father in heaven. Praise team comes forward at this moment as they get ready. I just want to lift up my voice to you because, Lord, there have been many times in my life that I have not had the frame of mind even to be here on this platform or on any platform. But, Lord, Through my weakness, you have become strong. And so, Lord, all power, all glory goes to you. And for all those ladies that are here today that have felt that they've been under the attack, that they've been burdened down, thank you for the examples of those that have gone before us. For, Lord, we stand on the shoulders of Mary. We stand on the shoulders of Joseph. But may we always be holding the hands of Jesus. We pray in his precious and holy name. Amen. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let us stand together.
amazing. This whole day is amazing. I'd really just like to thank everybody personally uh, for being here. Especially, I've heard things today. Uh, one, oh, Wesley, um, you know, he's, and she, is this, this was said, uh, the heart. <laughs> and that sticks with, that, I thank you so much for that. And that, that means uh, a lot because I guess I'm a, a heartfelt kind of a guy. And Pastor, I don't just really like you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and continue to keep your hands on that plow because because of you others will keep their hands on their plows as well um, Andrea is supposed to do some of these things but there's a Sabbath school survey and what I'd like to do is ask I'm sorry oh yes yes yeah um, please sit down <laughs> I should know that, but uh, I stand all day. It's just normal for me. <laughs> I would like to ask Melanie to uh, come down and share with you some things about Sabbath school. And here she is. And she has more to say than I can tell you. And even though I have lots to say, lots to say I can give you this right here. Yeah, take this one. Okay, so... What did Pastor say about what made parenting easier for him and his wife? Prayer. prayer. But you know, even with prayer, it's really hard, isn't it? It takes a village. What's our village? Sabbath school. We had a very lively Sabbath school pre-COVID, and then it sort of died. So, um, I don't know where the survey is. I know that Andrea did uh, print some out. Oh, she said it's on the table. I would like everybody, whether you zero or whether you 105, to fill out the survey. The reason we want it to be filled out is how many people are actually interested in Sabbath school. The question is, why don't you come to Sabbath school? Whether you don't feel like it, whether you're not interested, whether you can't get up in the morning, whatever, it's on there. Your age, when would you like Sabbath school to be if you don't like the particular time? And what, what do you want from Sabbath school? Um, we are focusing more on the kids um, than the adults, but as I said, I'd like every single person to follow one out. Put it in this folder that's going to be on the back table back there. Um, I think there's one online. I'm not sure. I've got to uh, check with Andrea. But um, we need to know what to prepare for. We need to know how many teachers to get. We need to know what curriculum to get. So please fill out your survey this week and next week. It will be out. Any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's fine. Yes. Absolutely. Good morning, Saints. Um, like my son, well, obviously we're family. I've traveled around quite a bit. At one point, I was in construction, went from North Carolina to Georgia. Obviously, when I get there, I know nobody. Guess what? You go to the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church, you sign up for your Sabbath school class, and all of a sudden, you have family and best friends you've never met before. You can walk into a big church with a broken arm. You can walk in and walk out, and there's no difference. But when you walk into your Sabbath school class, which is a small group, that's your family. You walk in with a broken arm, you walk in with a tear in the eye, they're going to know. That's when Christ really brings us together as a family and can minister to us. Thank you. How true is that? I've lived on two different continents. Doesn't matter, whatever the language, you go to a, a Seventh-day Adventist church, 9.30, 10 o'clock, you're going to find a Sabbath school, you're going to find a service that you're going to feel comfortable with. So help us revive our Sabbath school. Fill out the survey, let's see what we can do to make it better. Thank you. Outstanding. How many people think that we're in control of things? Eh, whatever we can, but God is in control. We have no idea what could transpire ahead of us. But what we should do is compose ourselves, stop, take a step back, and watch the Lord work. Every time I get involved with something, I'm going to fix it. I can't fix anything. I, I can't fix anything. But the Lord fixes it 
for us. That was the speech I wanted to make. And the problem with this thing is that if you put this and me together, it's like throwing gasoline on an open flame. It, uh, I won't shut up forever. <laughs> but I wanted to talk about Sabbath School a little bit, just a little bit. Um, there's a lady upstairs who's, she doesn't believe it, but she's responsible for me being part of Sabbath School. And of course, I am, you know, criminally negligent of all things, but the Lord does work in mysterious ways. Find an interest in Sabbath School, and she's exactly right. You walk in there, you can be nobody. You can be somebody. We are all somebody in the eyes of the Lord. So much so as to think that he would send his son to die for us, even before we became part of the church, and especially becoming part of his church. How much more would he <laughs> long to gather him under uh, us under his wings? Um, so the Sabbath school service is there. Today, prayer service, uh, 2 a.m. There's hymns, prayers. There's a bunch of stuff com coming up, and I'd like you to, to do that because I will go on forever, but I did want to say one thing. That was an outstanding message today. Thank you for it. Oh, don't, can you do the prayer for the... For the, for the, for the, for the sure, sure. Thank you, Wesley. <laughs> Um, okay, so just a couple of reminders. Today at 2 p.m. we have our prayer service, and we're doing uh, hymns, prayers, testimonies, so be sure to stay after uh, potluck for that. Um, next we have, um, later today, at 2 o'clock and 5 p.m., we have card making, and um, it's going to, Walk of Faith is putting on like a Christmas family night, and so there's going to be a potluck dinner, games, cookie exchange, and the card making, um, and that will be downstairs so, um, and then tomorrow, the Carters have invited the whole church for a Christmas party and brunch at their house. So, Salithiel, you want to come up here and share what you need to? Good morning. For, first off, I would be remiss if I did not apologize beforehand. It's all my fault. We're still under construction. My wife is deeply upset about it, but we're going to have a good time regardless. So please use the back door. The front door, we were hoping to be finished with the stairs, but couldn't finish it. So my fault. Uh, second thing, I would also like to encourage prayer for tomorrow's get together. There are a number of people coming who I've been inviting to church forever. And for whatever reason, they weren't able to get here, so I figured out I'd bring the church to them at the house. So please pray, please, please engage people that you don't know, make them feel comfortable, because again, we're all trying to get to the kingdom together. Thank you. Thank you, and Salithiel and Michelle, thanks so much for inviting and opening your house to everyone. So make sure you RSVP and the address is up there on the announcements or you can get in touch with them. Um, also starting December 12th, we have teen and young adult volleyball night. Um, this is happening at NOAA, our school in Sheffield Lake. So that's from you know ages 30 to 13 to 30-ish, um, from 6.30 to eight. If you need more information, get in touch with Natalie. And also next Saturday at 7 p.m., um, our school, Noah, is having a Christmas concert. Um, so it is called the Starlight Concert, and we're all invited. So if you have the time and you'd like to go hear beautiful Christmas music, please go out and support them next Saturday at 7 p.m. Um, and finally, uh, just to give a little bit um, more look ahead into the following weeks as we finish off the new year, we have on December 17th, Dr. Kara Kishbaum speaking and the NOAA concert, of course, I mentioned. And uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve, we will have a Christmas service and also a blood drive that day from 9 to 2 if anyone is able and willing to donate. And we are also open on December 31st, New Year's Eve, where we will be having communion that day. So um, a beautiful way to finish off the end of 2022. And um, I think that's it. So thank you all so much for joining us. And let's quickly just pray for food as we all rush down for lunch together. <laughs> Dear Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us all together. Um, thank you for uh, creating this communal way of worshiping you and for encouraging each other and for praying with each other and for singing together. Um, and we ask you now to 
Uh, bless the food, bless our conversations, and um, may you continue to bring your family closer together. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you.